Hello, thank you all for being here on this Tuesday, May the 5th. Today we're hosting a presentation on COVID-19. Why should I have a will? My name is Ashley, Client Services Coordinator, and I have the privilege of introducing our presenter, Marie Elena Puma. She's partner at Russo Law Group, Long Island's signature elder law, special needs, and estate planning law firm, with five offices on Long Island and New York City. We are recognized as a best law firm by the US News, and we've had the privilege of helping over 17,000 families. Maria Elena has played a role to the success of the firm joining in 1991. Her, her areas of practice include trust and estate administration, elder law, special needs and estate planning, guardianships, and real estate. Since 2016, she has been recognized as a super lawyer every year. That's quite impressive. In July 2017, she launched Russo Law Group's Alzheimer's and Dementia Caregivers Support Group, affiliated with the Alzheimer's Disease Resource Center. She's a member of several professional organizations, including the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys, referred to as NALA, member of several local county bars, and the Academy of Special Needs Planners. Finally, she has served on the board of NALA and the New York chapter of NALA and numerous estate administration and planning committees over the years. Now, before I pass it over, one quick housekeeping item. Please send us your questions as you have them, but be sure to include your email address. We will do our best to answer everyone in real time, but if for some reason we can't, we will follow up after the program. And with that, I will invite Maria Elena to take it from here. Thank you, Ashley, and welcome everybody today on this very sunny Tuesday. Um, well, why should I have a will? It's a very good question, and I'm going to do my best today to answer it for you. Today's agenda, we are going to address three main things. What is a will, and how does it work? What are the benefits of a will? And what steps should I take now? The COVID-19 pandemic is a wake-up call for everyone to implement an estate plan. If you do not already have one, or if you, to review and update your existing estate plan if you have one, this is the time to do it. As a result of a global health crisis, it is critical for you to be prepared in order to protect yourself and your family. Today, I will focus on a last will and testament, which is one of the documents that is essential for your comprehensive estate plan. When I meet with clients, they, they express to me three major concerns. One is who will get my assets when I pass away? Two, who manages my estate? And three, how do I protect my loved ones? Well, my answer to them is a last will and testament will address your concerns. So let's look at the first question. What is a last will and testament? A last will and testament is a legal document that allows you to control who will inherit your assets upon your death and to appoint someone who you trust to serve as your executor. Your executor will administer and distribute your probate estate in accordance with your wishes and desires as stated in the provisions of your last will and testament. You, as the maker of the will, are known as the testator. Okay, so let's look at the components of a will. A will is a written legal document that takes effect upon death. So you execute that will during your lifetime, but the terms of that will are not implemented until after you die. Just wanna take a side step here and talk to you about two exceptions to the uh, writing requirement of a will, and that is a holographic will and a non cupative will. A holographic will is written entirely in the handwriting of the testator, and a non cupative will is a um, non-in-writing oral testimony that the testator must declare to two witnesses who can clearly establishes, establish the provisions of what your intentions are re with regard to your assets and who your executor will be. I just point these out. This is not the focus of today's program, but I just wanted to let you know that these are two wills that you may hear about. They will not work well for you because they only work in very limited circumstances. 
for example, um, specifically when somebody's in the United States Armed Forces or a mariner at sea during um, military service during a war or an armed co conflict, and they are not valid for the person's lifetime. They expire um, after a specific period of time. So um, what you need to do is the kind of will that I'm going to talk about is a written will where you state what your wishes are and, and it is in writing and witnessed. So a will is a document that is revocable. You can change it during your lifetime as often as you want, as many times as you want. So why do a last will and testament? One, it allows you to control who will inherit your assets. Two, it will allow you to appoint someone who you trust to serve as your executor to implement your wishes. And three, it allows you to provide for your loved ones in a very protective way. So those are the key items of a will. Without a will, the New York laws of intestacy will tell you who will get your assets when you pass away and will tell you who will manage your estate. So you're giving up control by not having a will and letting New York law determine those issues for you. Okay, so how does a will work? People automatically think, and it's a common mis misconception, that just because they execute a will during their lifetime, that's it, it's active, and there's nothing else that needs to be done. Um, that is not true. Um, a will needs to be validated after your death. So that is done through a probate proceeding. A probate proceeding is a court proceeding to submit the last will and testament of someone who has passed away to the surrogate's court for approval and to appoint the executor named pursuant to the will. The probate proceeding is commenced in the county in which the person resided or owned real property at the time of death. Okay, so to commence the probate proceeding, the nominated executor under the will would file a petition with the surrogate's court and also submit other ancillary documents that the beneficiaries would have to sign and um, affidavits and so forth. Um, once the court reviewed all those documents and reviews the will and finds that it was executed properly, um, then the court will admit it to probate and issue what's known as letters testamentary, which appoint the executor. The letters testamentary are the legal document that allows your executor to act on your behalf after you pass away and to implement the terms of your will. Now, it's very important to understand that only certain assets are governed by your will, not all of your assets. I always like to tell my clients that assets can be divided into two types, I say two pots, the probate asset pot and the non-probate asset part. The probate asset part are assets that were solely named in your name alone, so total, solely titled in your name alone. So your executor under your will would have to use letters testamentary in order to deal with those assets. Non-probate assets are assets that pass outside of your will by operation of law because during your lifetime you entitle those assets in a way that says upon my death this is what happens by operation of law. So examples of that would be a beneficiary designation, right of survivorship designation, or living trust format. And, um, and um, the executor does not have any authority over those assets that pass outside of the will. Now, as an aside, we're going to talk about those non-probate and probate assets more specifically in the next slide. But as an aside, I just want to mention that in the event that you die without a last will and testament, you will be considered in New York State to have died in test state. And the laws of New York will determine the intestate distribution and govern the assets that were solely owned in your name alone at the time of your death. So it has a similar proceeding. It's not called a probate proceeding. It's called an administration proceeding. Um, but the difference is New York law says where your assets go and who your administrator will be. Okay, And that's based upon an order of priority that's in the New York law. It's important to note whether or not you have a will, any of those non-probate assets that we talked about will still continue to pass outside of the intestate estate. 
Okay, so now we're going to take a look at um, these, two these two types of assets more um, in depth. So the will is the first step. You the second step that goes along with that is to make sure you properly title your assets because if you don't have them titled in the right way, then your will will not be effective in terms of disposing of them and distributing them to your beneficiaries. So who gets the assets when I pass? You decide, okay? It's important to note that the terms of your last will and testament will only govern assets that were solely owned in your name at the time of your death. Again, these are known as the probate assets. Assets that you owned at death that have a right of survivorship, a beneficiary designation, or are held in trust will pass by operation of law outside of your will. Okay, and those are the non-probate assets that we talked about. So let's look at examples. Probate assets pass under the terms of your will, and it's any asset that you owned in your name alone when you pass away. So for example, I'm gonna use a bank and a brokerage account with an ownership title of John Smith. If it's clearly just in the name of John Smith, then it is clearly a probate asset and it will, it will pass under the terms of your will. A life insurance policy or an IRA that fails to designate a beneficiary, so which means that the proceeds will be payable to the estate would also be an example of a probate asset. Another example would be a deed to real property that was solely owned in the name of John Smith, or for example, John Smith and Mary Smith as tenants in common. Tenants in common means that they each, John and Mary, own their own respective shares of that asset, say 50-50 of that, of that house, say for the deed, and that would be a probate asset that would go under each of their estates. Now, on the other side, you'll see the chart here for non-probate assets. These are the assets, again, that pass by operation of law outside of your will. So the terms of your will do not apply to these assets. I cannot state that enough because my, I meet with clients often and they don't understand uh, the distinction. So let's look at some examples here. So we've got bank and brokerage accounts. They can be held TOG, which is transfer on death, POG, which is payable on death, ITF, which is in trust for, or JTWROS, which means joint tenants with right of survivorship. So if you have a title on an asset, that's TOG, POG, ITF, JTWROS, the will, your will, will not apply to how that asset is distributed, okay? Because you already said in the title of that asset what happens when you pass away. So in that case, you would contact the financial institution and they would provide you with their paperwork um, that's necessary in order to transfer the asset and you would supply them with a certified death certificate. And again, this would be done outside of your will and outside of the court. Another example of a non-probate asset is a life insurance policy and an IRA with a designated beneficiary. Um, another example would be a deed to real property that's owned as joint tenants with right of survivorship or as tenants by the entirety. So upon the death of one of the owners, it automatically passes to the surviving owner. I just wanna point out that tenants by the entirety is a special way that is only for spouses to own real property. So um, unless you're spouses, you cannot own property as tenants by the entirety. If you want it to pass as a non-probate asset, you'd have to own it as joint tenants with right of survivorship. Lastly, um, living trust. This is another way to avoid probate, um, but I caution clients all the time that you must fund your assets into that trust in order for it to pass in accordance with the terms of the trust. A lot of times people think that their trust is funded and we find out after the fact that the assets were never put in there and they become probate assets, even though they may have been intended to be non-probate assets. What you need to know here, the difference between the probate assets and the non-probate assets is that the executor has no authority over, or control over distributing the non-probate assets. The executive's power is limited to the probate assets. Okay, so who manages my estate when I die? 
I'll say it again, it's a theme here, you decide. By having a last will and testament, you have the power, okay, in your will. You will nominate an executor or co-executors. We usually don't recommend that our clients nominate more than two people at once. You can then also put a provision in the will nominated, nominating a successor executor or successor co-executors in the event your primaries cannot serve. Um, I tell my clients it is very important that you select someone that you trust and who is capable to administer your estate because serving as an executor is not doing something in name only. You actually have fiduciary duties and responsibilities, okay? So what are some of those that you have to do under a will? Well, as executor, you have to preserve, protect, collect, sell, or transfer the assets. You have to value the assets. You have to pay the debts, the expenses, the taxes, the liabilities, the funeral expenses, the administration expenses, court filing fees, all of those items you'll have to pay on behalf of the decedent. And then you will have to do an accounting and distribute the assets to the beneficiaries under your will. Under, well, your executor will have to do that in accordance with your will. The executor also has to make sure that all tax filings are done, whether it's individual income tax returns of the decedent, whether it's fiduciary estate tax returns or fiduciary trust returns, or or an estate tax return on the value of the assets. So there's a lot of responsibility here. I want to point out though that executors are not on their own. They are authorized by the terms of the will to hire professionals to advise them. For example, a lawyer, an accountant, an appraiser, so uh, an uh, investment, broker. So these are people that, professionals, that are allowed to um, be hired and retained in order to provide advice and direction to the executor. Okay, so next question. So how do I protect my loved ones? Well, I think you know the answer. You decide. Um, so let's talk about how a will does that for you. A will allows you to provide for your loved ones in a protective way. And there are two main points I wanna make here. The first one is a testamentary trust, and the second one is through guardianship. So let's look at testamentary trust first. So a testamentary trust is not a living trust. It's a trust that, because you don't create it during your lifetime, it's a trust that's created by the terms of your will and then is put into effect after you pass away. And that's why it's called a testamentary trust. Now, when your will is admitted to probate, um, once it's approved, the court will, if there's a provision in there for a testamentary trust, the court will issue um, letters of trusteeship to the trustee, who's like the executor, but the trustee is in charge of the trust, okay? So when do we recommend a supplemental needs, uh, a testamentary trust? Well. I'm gonna point out two of them. One is a supplemental needs trust and the other is a minus trust. A supplemental needs trust is a trust um, that we recommend when the beneficiary has special needs, may have creditor claim issues, may have marital issues, may uh, be subject to undue influence. So you may have a concern there. They may have issues in terms of uh, being a spendthrift, gambling, drug or alcohol problems. So, you know, we don't live in a perfect world. So, um, you know, we may have to address these issues for one of our beneficiaries. Um, the alternative is, you know, nothing I would recommend necessarily, which is to disinherit them. Well, you don't have to do that. You don't have to disinherit a loved one. You can still provide for them and address these concerns in a protective way, okay? So the will allows you to do that in this example through a supplemental needs trust. Another example is what's known as a minor's trust. And again, upon the probate of your will, the court would issue letters of trusteeship to the trustee of this testamentary trust. And usually we put a provision in our wills for our clients that says, if a beneficiary is young, so, so for example, if you have a child or a grandchild or a niece or nephew who's say under 25 years old, 
their inheritance would be placed into a trust to be managed by the trustee in a protective way until they reach an age of financial responsibility. Okay, so you determine all that in the way we draft your will. Um, you can, it could be as simple or as, um, as complex as you wish to have it. You can stage distributions at specific ages so they get a specific amount of the trust, say at age 25 and a specific amount at age 30 and a specific amount at age 35 and maybe they don't get the balance until age 40. So whatever it is, we can design and draft the document to work with you to address whatever your concerns are. Okay, the second point I wanna make here about providing for your loved ones in a protective way is um, through the guardianship of minor children. And um, unfortunately, you know, we hope that this never happens, but God forbid um, both parents die and a child is under age 18, a will will allow you to put provisions in it as to the person or persons that you want to appoint to be the guardian or co-guardians and successor guardians for your children in order to take care of them. Um, Obviously, you know, if only one parent dies, the second parent still has those legal rights, but in the event that both parents are deceased, um, a will would allow you to think ahead in the future uh, to provide for people uh, to take care of your children and also to have discussions with those people during your lifetime um, to make sure um, that they are people that would be willing to accept that obligation um, and serve on behalf of your children. So the point, uh, overall uh, summation point I want to make here is that um, a will is a very, very valuable legal document that you could put into place because it is flexible. And again, you could change it as many times as you want during your lifetime. And as the situations and the circumstances of your family change during the course of years, um, it will allow you to to accommodate those issues. So for example, if you had a non-probate estate and you, and you designated um, John Smith as the beneficiary of that asset, and at the time you titled that account, John was healthy and well with no issues, that's great, you avoided probate. But say you don't die for another 20, 30, or 40 years later, and that by that time, John is, um, a special needs person who's receiving government benefits, it would be, he would lose his benefits if he received monies outright. So um, a non-probate asset like that wouldn't work in his behalf. It would be better to have a provision in the will that said if a special needs person who's receiving government benefits is a beneficiary at the time of my death, then their share goes into a, um, a testamentary supplemental needs trust. So. It's a common misconception that probate is bad, but probate can be very valuable to provide for your loved ones in a protective way um, that you really can't get uh, through a non-probate asset. All right, so what are the benefits of a last will and testament? You control who inherits your assets by documenting your wishes. You control who manages your estate by empowering someone you trust. And again, as we saw, it could be an executor and a trustee and a guardian for your minor, minor children. So you're really planning ahead um, to be protected for your family. Three, you can provide for your loved ones in a protective way. You don't have to disinherit anybody. You can make sure they're provided for. You have a trustee that manages the assets for them and their needs are taken care of during their lifetime. And four, all together, you will have peace of mind knowing that you have put a plan in place to ensure that your loved ones are provided for in the ways that you desire and in the ways that they need to be protected. Okay, so summary. We saw those concerns at the beginning, the three concerns, uh, who will control the disposition of my assets, who uh, will manage my estate, how can I ensure that assets pass to my loved ones in a protective way, well, the solution to that is a last will and testament. You control the disposition of your assets. You select who will manage your estate and a trust, say if you have a testamentary trust, or who will be the guardians of your children. You ensure how the assets will pass to family in a protective way.
All of this together provides you peace of mind. The COVID-19 pandemic is a reminder to all of us that life is so unpredictable and that we must be prepared. With threats to our health, our lives, our finances, there's no better time to protect yourself and your family. Now is the time to make a last will and testament. And if you already have one, now is the time to review it in order to ensure that it accurately reflects your desires and the needs of your beneficiaries. Okay, so what steps should you take now? Hopefully, I've convinced you of the importance of having a last will and testament. So, your peace of mind action plan has just two simple steps. One, consult with and retain the services of an, services of an experienced attorney who cares about you and the needs of your family. Do not procrastinate. During this pandemic, the, having a will is even more important than ever before. Step number two, implement that plan to protect your assets and to protect your family. If you already have a plan, review your plan and update it to make sure that it reflects the current desires that you have and the current laws that are in place. Unfortunately, it's human nature to procrastinate and oftentimes people will consult with an attorney, think about uh, making a will, and then they really don't do anything to actually put, put it into effect. So please take the times that we're living in now and use that as an impetus to say, now is the time I must put a will in place to protect myself and my family. Okay, so at this point, we are going to turn over to um, Ashley and see if we've received any questions, and I will do my best to answer them. Sure. Th thanks, Maria Elena. Uh, our first question is from John, and his question is, what is the difference between a will and a revocable trust, and does he need both? He's 63 years old. Okay, this is a very good question, and... Um, <clears throat> The, the difference between a will and a revocable trust is whether or not you are actually in a surrogate court proceeding for the probate. So um, it has to do with those two pots of assets that I spoke about, probate assets and non-probate assets. A revocable trust is an example of a probate asset, of a non-probate asset, but it's only as good as if you funded your assets into that trust, otherwise those assets become probate assets. So if you want to avoid a court proceeding, you could still provide for your family in a protective way and avoid probate and do that document through a revocable trust. So um, we always recommend that a client has a will, no matter what, and they also can have a revocable trust as well. So we may do a different will if the person has a revocable trust than um, another client who maybe just has a will without a trust. But Basically, a will is a document that is probated, and a revocable trust is a document that is not probated. But again, as I said earlier, you must make sure it is funded. Great. Okay, that's the only question that I see. Thank you. Okay. All right, no other questions. All right, so what makes Russo Law Group different? I am proud and privileged to uh, answer this question. Um, I've been at the firm for almost 30 years, um, and I've been mem a member of Team Russo, as we are so happy to call ourselves. Um, we like to distinguish ourselves from other law firms, the attorneys and the staff. We create relationships with our clients and their families. We don't, it is not just simply a legal transaction. Um, we want to assist our clients with whatever their needs are. And if we can't help them, we will try to do our best to get them in the right hands of the professionals that can help them. We have five convenient office locations in Garden City and Lido Beach in Nassau County, Islandia and Bayshore in Suffolk County, and then in New York City as well. We're licensed in multiple states, Florida, Massachusetts, New Jersey, and of course, New York. Um, we have co-counsel relationships throughout the country. So we work closely with other attorneys um, and, um, so that if you have a need that crosses over into another, another state, we can assist you with that as well. 
We are very strong with handling crisis situations. And the key to that is that we are very good listeners, um, which is very necessary in order to address um, a family that is in crisis. So we are there to hold your hand and to get you through that situation. We are involved in the community, but we are also committed to the community. We, are, we participate in many activities as a firm and individually in the community, different walks, different fundraisers. For example, um, we've done the breast cancer walk, we've done Alzheimer's walks, we've done um, fundraising and walks for CP Nassau County, uh, for CP Nassau for their um, adaptive playground for children with special needs. I personally run um, a support group, as Ashley mentioned earlier, through the Alzheimer's Disease Resource Center, um, where we meet once a month, and it's a support group for the caregivers of, of loved ones with dementia and Alzheimer's. Um, we also are very proud to um, support the phenomenal Teresa Foundation, which is an organization that helps children with special needs and adult children with special needs to participate and offer them opportunities um, in art, recreation, dance, and music that they may not have otherwise. Um, we also have a client maintenance program and a family plan. This is all about creating those relationships with our clients and their family. We want to make sure that we take care of you and your family. We also offer discounted rates for legal fees for um, estate planning documents for members of your family who want to put an estate plan in place as well. We want to be a resource to you and your community and the community. We're proud to offer our services and our resources. We are committed. We've been doing so for over 30 years. Um, I also want to mention that Vincent Russo during this pandemic is doing a daily check-in every morning at 930, um, offering information um, to all of you. And also, as you know, from today, every Tuesday at one o'clock, we do a Facebook Live session for an area of the law that um, we feel would be beneficial. If you have any suggestions, you can always um, email us and let us know. Um, so let us help you. Let us make sure that you have a valid enforceable last will and testament. You need to see us or some or attorneys who are experienced. You need to seek the advice and counsel of an experienced estate planning attorney. A last will and testament is one of the most important legal documents in your estate plan because it allows you to control the distribution of your assets upon your death. By consulting with an estate planning attorney, you will have peace of mind knowing that your appointed executor will distribute your assets to your desired loved ones, that your trustee will implement and administer a trust for your loved ones. This will give you peace of mind and that is so invaluable. If you do not have a last will and testament, or if you would like to review your current last will and testament, please contact us. You can reach us at 1-800-680-1717. We understand that observing social distancing can make it more difficult to execute a will and legal documents due to the witness and notarization requirements. However, we can assist you with remote execution of a will and documents with the remote witnessing and remote notarization of documents all of which is in compliance with Governor Cuomo's executive order, orders. We also invite you to take advantage of our comprehensive website to learn more about how Russo Law Group may assist you, and that is www.vjrussolaw.com, COVID-19, uh, which is our special link to, uh, in light of the COVID pandemic. Um, and our website is www bjrussolaw.com. I thank you for participating today in our Facebook Live session. And on behalf of the Russo Law Group, I wish you and your families good health and safety.